I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today we take a look at conquering the mind with some very special guests. People that make money without meaning usually end up in debauchery. I don't promote it. I think that you need to find something that is deeply meaningful to you. Because you know when you're doing this show, for instance, or when you're doing service for people and you actually know you're making a difference and people come up and say, thank you, you've made a trajectory difference. Nothing to do with money. It, well, it, it, you deserve it, to get paid for it. This is not like it doesn't have anything to do with money. You want a fair exchange. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a deep meaning there and it means something you've yeah. made that difference. Yeah. I, I had a dinner and lunch with a gentleman who made $75 million a year. That's a good income. That's one of the best yeah. incomes. Yeah. Okay. Now, this gentleman had a series of media um, tabloids that he owned, which sell a lot. They're some of the biggest mm -hmm. sellers, the tabloids. And this gentleman uh, drank 18 drinks during lunch. Wow, lunch. Yeah, because <laughs> he had no that. meaning in his work. It was purely a money-making yeah. system that had no meaning in his life. He didn't feel like he made any difference. But I also know people like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett that have fortunes, but they do something meaningful on a daily basis that they love doing. You don't see debauchery there. You don't see uh, um, a living your life to escape. They see it leaving life to fulfill something meaningful. So I'm a firm believer in finding something that serves people's needs, but not at the expense of yours, and not trying to do something that's just for what you want, narcissistically, that doesn't serve people's needs. You have to find an equity between what you would love to do and what people would love to get. When you find that, you found your niche, you found meaning, and you found something you can't wait to get up in the morning and do. One of the most universal principles that I've found in every discipline that I've studied, which is 300 now, uh, is the law of the one to many. The law of the one and the many. The law of the okay. one and the many. Yeah. The law of the one and the many says, as you approximate the one, you have forces to disperse it into the many. And as you approximate the many, you have forces to disperse it into the one. So for instance, uh, radiation comes from a point source and radiates out to an infinite number of radii. So one to many. Mm -hmm. But gravitation goes from the infinite many into one. So radiation and gravitation, which are inversions of each other, one is light and one is going to dark, um, underlie much of this universe, light and dark, you might say. So that's a law of the one and many. But that has application in sociology, for instance. When you're, uh, when you're amongst, a, you're, you're isolated from a group, you want to find a group to fit in. Mm. But once you find the group and fit into it, you want to stand out. Mm -hmm. So as you move towards one, you also want to diversify into many, and find your own uniqueness. Um, you have monarchies, democracies. When you're dating many people, you're trying to find that special one. Once when you, you get, found the one, you're bored. You're bored, you wonder what the <laughs> hell the yeah, others are doing, yeah. right. So this law of the one to many, it's also called the law of similarities and differences. It's a law of the peace and war, or cooperation and competition, or build and destroy. It's a conservation law, it's a symmetry law that that applies in every field so far I've studied. And so that's a very, I, I define the universal law as something that is universally applicable. And, and macro, micro scales in between, uh, and also in all the different disciplines, which are just views of the universe, you might say. So that would be one. Now, you asked about the secret, and that was about the and law, the law of, attraction. of attraction. Yes. I, I'm, I'm not as mystical about the law of attraction. I think of the law of attraction as that when you really are pursuing something that's really high on your values, mm -hmm. the pulvinar nuclei in the thalamus, which is a subcortical brain area, is a gate or filtering mechanism. And based on what you value most, it filters your sensory perceptions in a way that allows you to maximize the attainment of whatever it is that's highest on your value. So if you're a mother and you have three children and they're all under the age of five and you're really focused on those children, if you walk in a mall, if your highest value is your children, you will spot children's clothes, children's entertainment, children's education, children's health items in the mall. So you will spot things and they'll jump out at you because of your filtering mechanism in the thalamus, you'll spot that and you'll delete the other stuff. It'll go unconscious. Mm. So you filter things. But if you're attempting to live by lower values in your value list, mainly because you're trying to subordinate to other people and live and please other people and you know, live in the shadows of people instead of true to yourself. You'll set goals that aren't really high in your values and the filtering system is not as strong. And so you won't see opportunities, and you won't see the synchronicities and you won't take actions and make decisions effectively. And so the secret will think, you'll think, well, the secret's not working for me. So you have to know what's really valuable to you 
And to the degree that you do, and to the degree that you prioritize your actions and prioritize your, your, your life, you maximize what we call the law of attraction, which is the increasing probabilities of achieving what you set out for. I went through a, a bout of depression where I ended up kind of falling off my, my grind and I lost the job, so I didn't know how to pay the bills. At the age of 26, I found myself reluctantly moving back home, right? We spent 18 years of our life hoping about moving out of the house. <laughs> and here I am at 26, going back home to mom and dad. And so on top of all that, I lost the job. The car got repossessed for non-payments because you can't pay bills without a job. I ballooned about 40 to 50 pounds in weight because I was an emotional eater. And my lowest point, I had thoughts of suicide because I was so depressed. I couldn't find a way out of the hole that I found myself in. And the way I rebounded back off of that was I discovered my purpose. Purpose is the reason why we are here. For anyone going through COVID-19 setbacks and shutdowns, and you're not sure what to do in the next stage of the journey, lock on to your purpose. Figure out why you're still here, why you made it. And how did you lock on to that purpose? Because look, I'm, 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 I'm hearing you, I'm hearing that you went mm -hmm. through a horrible heartache and that we all know breakups mm -hmm. can be really, mm -hmm. really awful, but actually they, they yes. can be a big lesson as well, if you can learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do believe everyone's in your life for a reason, and that's maybe to show you the way forward. But when mm -hmm. you're in that depth of despair, how do you actually wake up and discover what your purpose is? And, and how would you mm -hmm. invite other people to say, you know, wake up to mm -hmm. that purpose. Absolutely. So the thing about purpose is this, is purpose has been with us since we come onto the planet. The problem is no one tells us to discover purpose. People tell you to go to school. They tell you to get a good job. They tell you to get a degree. They tell you to get married. They tell you to settle down. They tell you to chase wealth and acquire things. But no one ever from childhood to adulthood said, young man, what's your purpose? Why are you here? So a lot of times your purpose can really be dictated by the unique gifts and talents that you're sitting on. I tell people all the time, my favorite animal on this planet is a cheetah. And a cheetah is known for reaching speeds of 70 miles per hour. Uh, two things I've never seen, Sonia, I've never seen a cheetah confused about his gift of speed. We've never seen that. We've never turned on a wildlife program and saw two cheetahs hungry, not sure how to catch the meal. They know that gift and talent lets them catch that meal, but they also know that gift and talent allows them to avoid other predators that can create harm for them, right? You, you can't kill what you can't catch. So if I know that every creature on this planet has some sort of unique gift and talent that helps it makes its way easier, then the question I got to ask everybody, the question I have to ask myself, why do I have this gift of communication? Why do I have this gift of creativity? And as a young man growing up, I skipped the grade. I went from kindergarten to second grade, so I skipped first grade, which means I had a super fast learning curve. Why do I have this fast learning curve? 99% of the time, your giftedness is the very thing that's been given to you to help you walk out your purpose. So if I know my gifts and my talents, that's one way to figure out what I'm supposed to do with them. But number two, I got to figure out what am I passionate about? What are the things, the arenas that where I'm just drawn in, where I could study, I could listen, I could talk about for hours on end and never get tired of it. Most of the times, whatever I'm passionate about is the foreshadow to my purpose. So for me as a young man, I just I decided to do the real heavy work, right? The shadow work to figure out you went through this relationship challenge, you lost all these things you thought were of so much value to you. So now that everything has been stripped from you and you have nothing. What do you have to rely on? You know your gifts, you know your talents, and you know you're passionate about helping others. Could it be that you have this gift and talent of communication and some of the situations you've been through are there to help you resonate with other people so you can walk out that thing called your purpose? I was always too busy, so I've been putting it off. I even had people book it in for me and then I cancel. Right, so I was always too busy to do nothing. That's yeah, yeah, I get it. That's just yeah, crazy. Yeah. But this is, it, is why is it coach... a guilt feeling. No, 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 no. This is why coaching is so powerful because you can be a high, 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 high performer, like a warrior. Look at me, I'm covered in tattoos. I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. It's who I am. But when you're a warrior, you're in the arena, fighting, 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 and you can't see anything other than what you can see in front of you. So it took me to almost kill myself to be able to look at things from the pavilion of my life and to be able to look in and say, actually, 
JP, you need to do things You can't always fight. Yeah, and also, you can't, and I don't want to say you can't always be in intensity. You can be, but I, I believe there's more beauty in, in life, in being able to slow down and still hustle, still be a high performer, still, you know, get loads done, but do it from a place of love, grace and ease, as opposed to, oh yeah, on to the next thing and screaming and shouting and hey, I, I was like an adv advocate of Tony Robbins and I am still an advocate mm. of Tony Robbins, but I represented Tony on all these stages and you know, lots of things come into our life for a certain reason and sometimes a season. And for me, that season of that world is, is complete for me now because I can't, for me to go where I need to go and want to go and how I want to serve, I need to bring myself back down to the ground because if I'm too noisy and intense, I can't allow other people to be healed by me. I don't, I don't think, right? So I'm very grateful to that part of my life. But like I said, from my accident i knew i needed to do some work on myself i needed to slow down i needed to stop the bullet train and i needed to look at what are the things in my life that i was putting off one of my regrets so i i booked some things in the diary that i'd always been putting off i'd went on a 16-day uh, silent meditation retreat where i not only did six days or 10 days i i went 16 days living in silence wow. i have known 10 years about plant medicines and I kept putting it off uh, for many reasons, one of them being fear. I know that plant medicines require you or, you know, these jungle yes. retreats and I, ceremonial. I, I, I'm, I'm looking into it now. Did you do ayahuasca? Yes, yes. And, oh, wow. Um, I, know and that... I didn't know that about you. Oh, I it, thought you knew. It, no. Was this, is it quite recent? Yeah, very recent. But I know that... That they... might be a whole new episode. That's a whole <laughs> another episode. And I will keep sharing that. And I'm just very careful about, you what, know, I don't want to come out of the experience and be like, oh yeah, you should do this, you should mm. do this. No, you really should do this. Um, anyway, I did it and I didn't do it for many years because I knew it required you to face yourself. What did you learn? The about? research that I didn't do, I knew that it was going to require me to maybe remember some things that I'd blocked out. And I've, lived in fear of that for many years because I don't remember a lot of my childhood. I have some great memories. I have some normal memories, some challenging memories, but I have these pockets where I'm like, I don't really remember anything from that time in my life. So I was in fear. But once again, if I was to live with no regrets, would I want to do that? Absolutely, yes. So I did it just recently, and that was incredible. Your question was... Can you, can you talk about, or what did I, you learn I, about yourself, or what came up for you <clears throat> in the ceremony? Sonia, this is really a whole other conversation. So what I will say, it was, you can do five night retreats, three night mm -hmm. retreats, two night, one night. I did two nights. Okay. And you are told that to come there with no expectation, just appreciation for being there, mm -hmm. and being ready for anything and everything. And Mother Ayahuasca or the grandmother, this plant medicine will give you what you need or what you can handle, right? Kind of like God. God only gives you what you can handle. And the first night, I, yeah, I experienced something that was just a beautiful moment of clarity in my life, like a very, very powerful moment that I needed right then right there at that time in my life on that day can you talk about how it felt or what it felt? freeing the most freeing moment of my life i just smiled laughed out loud cried um, it was just like i was free i was just free of... um, what did it look like <clears throat> i don't want to freak out some <laughs> people watching this so so basically ayahuasca is about reaching your mm. third, you drink this root yeah. from the Amazon and you drink it in a tea and you meditate. And through meditation, which already gives you, if you're really good at meditating, you can reach your pineal gland, your third mm -hmm. eye, yes. right? Yeah. And, and, and see visions and visions of your past, but also visions of your future and, and get incredible, incredibly powerful insights for your life. And meditation does that, but 
this drinking this thing just takes it to the all it's like level. you don't have to try you okay. don't have to try it's just wow. like okay. <laughs> you're there yeah so uh, i went there and i was in a around hut a ceremonial hut in england uh, with lots of other people on new year's eve what a great date yeah 2000 is so this yeah. new year's 2019 oh. to 2020 and uh, long story made very short just I just went into a beautiful, euphoric, present meditation. And then at one point I looked up and the whole ceiling just opened up. I just saw a white light. I'm not religious, but it was God or Mother Ayahuasca. And just a voice said to me, the answer to everything in your life is joy. Wow. Now, you know, just if you reframe it, it's more like grace, ease, slowing down, you know, having more mm. fun. Everything that I'd been seeing... Uh, I was now seeing it and feeling it here. And it was just, and it, it just was one line of one line. The answer to everything, JP, was joy, is joy. Well, first of all, I promise you it's going to be challenging. You are going to have failures, you will have setbacks. Uh, I think that's important to get out of the way first because so many things you see on social media and in magazines can glamorize. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this sort of leap from employee to entrepreneurship without also touching on the real world issues. You, you know, it's not going to be as easy as you suddenly switch from one career to another and it's all going to be rosy and it's all going to be very easy. It's not that way. I mean, after those 10 months, I still had to get a job because, you know, I needed income. But what I was able to do because I had these force, I was able to be more strategic. So I went into a job that wasn't as intense as before, but could leverage the skills I had already built. So it meant that I could be good at my job and I could use the hours outside of work and the weekends to start making steps forward. And I think that is an important element to determine how quick you can make that transition. Too many think uh, that to go from employee to entrepreneurship, you gotta do this sort of Hernan Cortes approach of where you burn the boats and the only way is forward. But in real life, we have obligations. You know, if you suddenly burn the boats and you cut all your sources of income and leap into entrepreneurship, well, if you go in cold, it's going to be very difficult to establish something that quickly. So the better way is to create a phased approach. Build it before you need it. If you're thinking you want to start a business in a particular industry or sector and you need relationships or networks or opportunities you're seeking, start to build that now while you have income coming in. Use the time outside of work. Be smart with your time. Build out your network now. So when you're ready to go, guess what? You're starting to put the pieces into place, which makes it even more likely that it'll be a smoother transition. And that's what happened to me. You know, I started to build my coaching business on the side, which started as many do uh, as one-to-one -one coaching. And it got to a point where I had to make a decision. I was saying to myself, well, I can't continue doing my day job and coach the people I had as clients during my lunch break, during after work, and on weekends, because I would have no time to relax. So I got to this position where I had to make a choice. Uh, and that was when I made the leap into entrepreneurship, when I decided to focus 100% on making this happen. How you direct your energy, how do you channel the energy once you've got that in your system? And especially in the times we're living in at the moment, it's so important to channel your energy into what you can control rather than what you can't. Because when we focus on what we can't control, whether it's the government response to the pandemic, whether it's when things are going to open up again, it can easily make you depressed. But when you focus on what you can control, now that's, that's an exciting part of moving forward because it empowers you to take action. You're looking for ways that you can be creative. You're looking for ways that you can move forward. And embracing the action-oriented mindset is one of the most common traits among the most successful. Talking of most common traits uh, amongst the successful, um, obviously, I, I know you're, you're a very successful coach and you um, and, and have uh, very successful clients. Have you sort of identified what, what those common traits they have? Mm. Everyone, I think that there are many differences between them. Uh, but I would say if I had to narrow it down to a few common traits, one 
uh, would be something I shared just now, which is this bias towards action. Mm. Uh, they have a massive bias towards action. So they're not afraid of starting before they're ready. Uh, you know, they, 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 they like to get on with it and yeah, they'll make mistakes. They'll, they'll have failure. Uh, but what they realize is that those mistakes and failures don't matter nearly as much as how they respond to it. And that's how we build resilience. So the first trait I, I observe is this sort of uh, action-oriented mindset. The second is a vision. This is something you will find amongst every successful business and leader mm -hmm. is they have a compelling and magnetic vision that not only helps them, but it helps motivate the employees that work for them and also allows people outside of their company or outside of their uh, close acquaintances to want to follow them. They have this story that people just want to be a part of. Uh, you know, just to share a great example with you, Brian Stevenson in his TED 2012 talk entitled, We Need to Talk About an Injustice, for 18 minutes that he spoke on stage, he managed to get the audience to contribute a combined $1 million into his nonprofit. That averages yeah. at over $55,000 per minute that he spoke. But all he did was he took a vision that he had for a better world and he shared it with an audience. But the energy that he shared it with, the passion he had for that topic, meant that he was able to draw every single person in the audience to want to become part of that story. So first, action-oriented mindset. Second is vision. Mm -hmm. And third, I find, is always seeking to be the dumbest person in the room. They're, oh, always yeah. looking to exactly. learn. They're always looking to learn. Because here's the thing, if you are the smartest, most ambition pers ambitious person in the room, how much further can you grow? You, you can't really grow that much. Oh, it's almost like an ego thing, isn't it? You're in a room, <laughs> you know you're the best. It's like, why, well, just to massage your ego. It's not exactly. Like so one of the skills they've adopted is what I call, because I grew up learning martial arts, is adopting a white belt mentality, remaining an eternal student. Because it. there's a Zen saying that goes, the difference between a master and a student is that the student is so focused on being a master to have the status, to have the money, but yet the master has cultivated the art of remaining an eternal student. So always be humble enough, open enough to learn from people, from experiences, from different perspectives. And this is why when you look at top performers, whether that's in the corporate world, whether that's in sport, they're always surrounded by mentors, coaches, advisors to help them up their standards every single day. Ever since I was young was just to wake up every day and love what you do. So yes, it kind of maybe seems, yeah, it might, it maybe seems like a big flip from going to wanting to be a professional athlete to presenting it. But it was just another skill set that I'd been working hard on and trying to hone some skills on that, you know, I guess growing up as a kid, I was quite focused. So I was looking at being a professional footballer, but always kind of had in the back of my mind because of the performing arts work I was doing that, well, once the career finishes, I could maybe go into TV and be the next Gary Lineker. So it wasn't necessarily a massive career flip change. It was just kind of bringing forward the later stage of the playing career to achieve the goal of making the Premier League. And I, I can feel your energy. You've got loads of it and it's, it's fantastic. Mm. It's great. It's vibrational. Uh, what sort of keeps you going because I mean you've, you've talked about so many different things and we were talking earlier before the cameras got rolling about all these different things that you're doing yeah. what keeps that motivation going and, and you your drive your ambition I think it's just every day just trying to create happiness I think that's the most important thing you know sadly we saw you know the weekend just gone you know Caroline Flack sadly took yeah, her life you know um, and I think we live in a world where you know there's always a lot of criticism and people want to jump to put things down and a big thing for me growing up has always just been to like live every day like it's your last um, I lost my nan four years ago and she was relatively young still um, and that just kind of taught me the lesson even more of like generating happiness that's always been the aim um, you know so if I'd never made it to the Premier League you know I would have been a bit gutted but the bigger aim has always been happiness and I'm a big believer that everyone should have the same goal in life everyone's number one priority and goal in life should be to create happiness. Wake up every day, love what you do, generate happiness for your friends, your family, and share it. That should be everyone's goal in life. 
Um, so for me, that's, that's always what it's been. I got asked the question a, a little while ago in the summer, um, and it was about how do you deal with you know, knockbacks and, and it yeah, was, low points. Yeah, yeah, those low points. And you know. It was really interesting because the question that was posed was, where were you five years ago? And it was quite ironic that five years ago, I was just signing my first Premier League contract to present it. Um, and then five years down the line, I had just been told my contract wasn't getting renewed. And they were like, well, you know, how do you deal with that? And I was like, well, the bigger picture is happiness every day. You know, I've been blessed and had this amazing five years worth of experience. Mm, yeah. I could deal with it negatively and moan or I've been dropped or didn't get a good enough explanation of why I haven't got it and be angry about it or go, well, OK, look, I've had been blessed with an amazing opportunity. How do I now open the next door? And for me, it's all... All because the main goal is happiness. And I think that's the important thing, you know, as I just said about in 2020, there's so many options that there's so many other things to do. It's easy to make money. Like if I had to, I'd go work in a pub tomorrow to generate income. Like it's generating money in 2020. You know, there's always a way. Um, you know, sometimes you have to take the sacrifice and do something that maybe you don't want to do, but you can do it. So I think for me, that happiness thing is what keeps me going whenever there's a knockback, just generating happiness and do you ever have a low point oh all the time we all do right yeah. you know um we all get knockbacks and we all kind of get moments where you have to go gee it must have been about six seven years ago now i went back to my old school and they said look can you do a, a talk on the secrets of success and i've gone well I've not really done much and what uh, got yeah. you into talking because you yeah. presenting talk, and i know presenting yeah. is very different to actually standing sure. on stage and, and, and yeah so, and so it was that i literally got invited back to my old school um and they said can you do this whole talk of your secrets of success and i've gone well don't really think I've done much, but yeah. And then I sat down and went, oh, okay. You know, by this point I was about 25. I'd just started doing the Premier League and I've gone, okay, well, I've done a Commonwealth Games. I've hosted like a national school hockey championships. I've done Wembley Arena. I've presented at the O2. And, yeah. Oh, okay. Not, I've done, not too much. I've done all right. I've done not too bad. Um, so I did this talk and talked about, you know, what I'd done thus far. And they said, this is amazing. Can you come back and do it? Um, and ever since I was a kid, I'd had this desire dream vision philosophy. A massive Muhammad Ali fan. Um, one of the okay. most important things he ever said. Like, he's got some amazing quotes. Oh, I, love, like, I, love I am the greatest. Yeah, and, yeah, But the biggest one for me is he said that champions aren't made in gyms. They're made from something deep inside, a desire, a dream, and a vision. You've got to have the skill and the will, but the will must be stronger than the skill. So I'd, I've had this post-it note on my bathroom mirror. I've still got exactly the same post-it note to this day. Put it up there when I was about 13. Um, so I'd always been inspired by him and just desire, dream, vision become my mantra. So I was like, okay, I could turn this talk in, into this, like, how have I achieved I it? it? Well, I it. you know, well, I had a plan and then there was fear and failure and there was sacrifice and there was opportunity and, and all the different elements then came together and, and this talk grew and it became the Desire Dream Vision Talk. Um, was doing it in the school, teachers would come up to me and say, do you know what, this is incredible, I'm trying to buy a new house at the moment, this has totally made me reevaluate how I'm going to do it. And they, they said, you should write a book. And I went, oh, okay. So I, I sat down. Um, in the March of 2016 and, and kind of wrote the kind of framework out and kind of left it there for, for kind of 12 months and just kind of developed it and grew it. And then March last year, it finally got published, self-published it all by myself. Um, we wrote to several publishers, well, more than several publishers. They loved the idea but didn't want to publish it. So I said, right, well, let's, let's control it. Like, let's, let's take control of it. And that's what we did. Came out, we did 500 limited first editions and they're pretty much all gone. So we're going to do a second edition at some point this year, which is really cool. Fantastic. So, yeah, it's amazing. I woke up that morning and my hands were sweaty and I felt like I've, I had the flu. You know, when you got the flu, you feel a bit feverish. Yeah. And once they got, yeah, I felt like I've had to, like some uh, a bottle of wine to drink. And at about three o'clock that afternoon, I literally felt, it felt like the walls of my apartment was, was caving in on me. And I, then I realized, hang on, there's something wrong. And I actually at one stage thought, am I having a heart attack? Is this what a heart attack is? Oh I didn't God. know because I didn't know what this was. And at about four o'clock, I realized I've got to phone my doctor now because he's got to leave the office at 4.30. And if I don't get him now, it's over for the weekends. And, so, and, I, and I got a bit scared. So I phoned my doctor and I explained what was happening. And he basically just said to me, listen, it's just obviously not, I can't diagnose you because you're not with me, but this sounds like you're having an anxiety attack or a nervous breakdown. Yeah, and, breakdown. Yeah. And he said to me, would you be able to drive to the pharmacy? And I, I literally was at a space where I was thinking, I wonder if I actually can drive. Anyway, I managed to get in my car, I slowly, slowly drove to the pharmacy and I walked in and I got myself um, 
uh, he actually phoned ahead. I just picked up the tablets in the pharmacy. I grabbed the tablets and I, and I consumed it. And a little bit later, I started feeling better. And I'm telling a long story now, but um, basically... That's great. It's interesting. Yeah, basically, I had another two tablets the Saturday morning. I had another two tablets the, Friday, the Saturday night. And when I woke up the Sunday morning, I because I don't like to use pharmaceuticals, I, I'll barely have a headache tablet when I've got a headache. It's just yeah. a silly little thing in my mind, whether it's wrong or not. I don't judge anyone that's... No, I agree, actually. I don't think it's good to be dependent on, um, yeah. on medication. I try not to as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, I literally uh, woke up that Sunday morning and I thought, you know, do you even know what you're taking firstly? So, and, I, and I realized, no, I don't. So I took the tablets, I Googled it quickly, and it was antidepressants. And so that was a shock to me, like, oh my gosh, hang on a bit. You don't even like to take headache tablets and you, you know, stop. So I didn't take it and I didn't know what to do. And immediately the anxiety kicked back in. Uh, it's amazing how your mind works. But the, the minute I decided not to take another one, the anxiety was straight back in. Mm. And um, that afternoon, eventually, I thought about our mutual friend, Alan Kleinans, and mm. because Alan was our Sharks motivational guy years ago, and we kind of stayed I in touch. I watching this. Hello, Alan. <laughs> Alan, my boy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, and, and long story short now, Alan kind of helped me over two or three Skype sessions with a few exercises, literally, to make me realize and make me understand that everything that's happening to me then is my mind. It is my thoughts. It's nothing else but my thoughts. None of it is real. It's real, but none of it is real. It is just my thoughts. It's my thought process and how I control these thoughts going into my mind. When I talk about these things, I always say, I'm not I'm also not a medical doctor and um, I'm very careful in, 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 uh, in saying this. I'm not saying it lightly like you have now, but no doubt. And, and again, we spoke about this, this the other day. Jodis, Dr. Joe Dispenza, I saw a video of him standing in front of the crowd of people and he said the following. He said to them, do you guys agree that right now there's enough evidence, modern evidence to prove that if you're stressed enough and if, you, if your anxiety is constant at a certain level that that could lead to uh, sickness and illness affecting the body so that could be cancer it could be stomach ulcers it could be skin uh, yeah. effects whatever and everyone nods the whole like a thousand people nod like this and i can see them all saying yeah because we all we know that it it it, it, it basically and what is what is anxiety and what is stress it's the mind right it's your thoughts that's it so we're saying that your mind can make you sick. And he's saying to them, if you say to me that the mind can make you sick, would you then agree that the mind can heal you? And at that moment, you can see the people going, and myself listening to this went, oh my gosh, it just dropped. The penny just dropped. You can, your mind, if it can make you sick, why can it not heal you? So it, it is impossible. It can only go one way. Then he explains further, the problem is with us as humans, we always, most of us are more negative than positive because the life is hard. So you never get yourself out of it. In order to do, to, to, to change your, your trajectory, to, to heal the body, you need to do conscious exercises. You need to do certain things. And, and meditation is obviously big for Dr. Joe Dispenza. But basically what I've learned from that is, is that this thing inside here, is so powerful more powerful than we could ever imagine and we've got this we've got this incredibly powerful thing here and we always when we don't use it to the fullest i mean i certainly don't i'm hoping to learn as i go every day to use this it's mine i can do with it without whatever i want so i'm fully with that I'm, i agree with you that again there are going to be people that are going to get cancer because of the way they eat or the, their lifestyle, uh, all those things, that's mm. there. But one must got to be careful if it comes to stress and anxiety on, on what you allow you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.
I believe health is the greatest form of wealth we have, which is why I'm so excited to be partnered with Brother in Arms. Brother in Arms is a wellness brand dedicated to working with veterans, first responders, and anyone on the front line. Through their education, support, and premium CBD products, they help alleviate and restore the lives of those that have been affected by physical and mental trauma. Learn about the life-changing benefits and power of CBD. Join their community today. Hit the link below.